All right, so we already have uh, a lot of people in here. So, Lexi, do you want to uh, turn off the music and we can just get this party started? Awesome. Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Brian Demas from Latinx and Animation and Lexi. Sorry, trying to find my mute button. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Lexi, I'm from Animations and welcome to our art panel with Francisco, Linda, Jeff, and Quindo, and Alfonso as well, but I'll let Brian explain. Yes, so uh, this is part two of our uh, quick uh, Rise of the Titans uh, Troll Hunters uh, series. Yesterday we did a panel with the directors of the movie and it was super exciting to kind of learn about their perspective in building this world uh, and, you know, this big finale that capped off an incredible journey for these characters and multiple series. But today we're going to dig a little bit deeper on the art side and we have uh, amazing speakers. We have Alfonso Blas, who is the production designer. We have Linda Chin, who is the art director. We have Jeff, uh, Jeff Liu and Kundo Rabaldi, who are from the CG modeling team and uh, oversaw a lot of the building the world in the 3D space. And also Francisco's back. Uh, he was not only the director of the movie, but he was also the co-art director on Three Below. And he also was a biz dev artist on Troll Hunters and also consulted on the art side of everything as well. So he was kind of pulling a little bit of double duty uh, on, in this movie as well. So uh, to kick things off, we uh, Alfonso Blas unfortunately couldn't be here today because he is in Europe. So the time difference, we couldn't make it work, but he still wanted to participate. So we actually recorded his interview and we're going to play this interview. So the first 15 minutes or so is going to be an interview with Alfonso Blas that we uh, recorded a couple of days ago. And then we're going to dig into uh, the rest of the art with uh, Linda and Francisco and also Jeff and Kundo. So uh, in the meanwhile, uh, if you have any questions that you have ready, please put them in a Q&A um, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the talk. So we'll hopefully get to ask some of those questions that people have. Uh, Lexi, anything else to add? Enjoy. All right. In that case, let me queue up this uh, interview and I'm going to share my screen. And just a reminder again, this isn't live, but it's as close to live as possible. All right, Alfonso, again, uh, happy to have you here. Uh, you know, for people that are watching, this isn't live because Alfonso is in a different time zone, so he couldn't be here and the uh, time that we're hoping to host it, but he still wanted to do this interview and chat a little bit about the project. And, you know, as the production designer of Rise of the Titans, you know, we thought it was very important to have you and also just your journey throughout the entire Tales of Arcadia universe and series. Um, we really were, are happy to have you here to talk about uh, a little bit of your background and also uh, your role in building this universe as well. So Alfonso, welcome. And just to kick it off, uh, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, like where you're from, uh, how you guys started in animation and how you started on Tales of Arcadia first, so Troll Hunters. All right, so thank you so much, yeah, for having me. I'm really glad to be here. And um, well, so I started, I study, I'm from Spain originally, and I'm, I'm uh, from Granada as a town in the south. And, you know, in my family and, and the whole my life, I was uh, in interested on art. And like my father painted, my brother is animator, and my grandfather was a, a sculptor. Uh, so there's a, a certain, uh, branch in my family that really interested in visuals and telling the stories and all that and from that i study fine arts in in granada and one of the thing is that that important thing for me is the teamwork and that's uh, something like it. i'm constantly always communicating to everyone is like that teamwork is is something that is drive me 
and um and well i started in animation and uh features uh i finished my art school and i started to create a portfolio thanks to all these um um artwork and artists that i admire uh, I, I was able to meet some of them and also to, you know, with internet, follow them in a way like Ray Mullins or Dai Sutsumi or, you know, all these amazing artists that I was inspired. And I saw what they they were working like, in and, and movies and, and all that and merged together and art movies with the teamwork. That's something I am amazed me. And like, I want to do that. You know? And all the making of those era of making of, of everywhere. And like, a, yeah, <laughs> so absorbing all that. And um, with Troll Hunters, what happened is um, uh, Rodrigo Blas, uh, my brother, he and, uh, and a small production, we create this short film called Alma. And that's something like um, uh, Guillermo likes it. Uh, Guillermo del Toro likes that short film and he has started to collaborate with him. And I was the art director on that uh, short film. And from there, he was, you know, in that moment, like in 2012 around, he said like, uh, you know, I have this idea that's developing. And that was the. the uh, sorry, Alfonso, can you repeat what he said? He cut off just a little bit. Yes, no problem. So it was in 2012, more or less. We, uh, Guillermo, was saying like, uh, you know, I have this idea of trolls in uh, in this world with this uh, little kid called Jim, very 80s, uh, ambient in um, and um, an atmosphere. And what happened from there, it was a um, presentation for a movie, uh, a, a feature long to, to DreamWorks. And from there, what happened is they really like it. They, from the schedule or whatever, or the deal or whatever, they turn it, that was the moment like Netflix has started to you know, grow um, as a platform and as streaming services. And they offer Troll Hunters to make a, a serialized uh, episodic show and they were like a it's a good uh, challenge to to do it that way so so i was involved from that beginning uh doing art and color mostly because my background is more like a painter a color artist and i have that eye of um looking always for cinematic lighting that's something like i i try to stamp everywhere i'm working is you know, create a color script, create color keys, you know, because of that thing, no, I admire certain artists that they do that way. I felt like, a, yes, I, I love to, to, to imply that one everywhere I, I, I can work. That's kind of my dream. And, and that's great to hear that you, you talk about the journey of coming from that um, painterly background as well, because, you know, you started uh, working on this Tales of Arcadia series, you know, the, the term usually they use for general artists at a studio is visual development artist. So you were doing a little bit of everything, but also like you were saying, focusing on these paintings to help with the color scripts and landing the mood of the show as well. Um, so as you start on Troll Hunters and then transition to Three Below um, and Wizards, you know, you moved on from visual development artist to an art director you know, so how was that change as, you know, the series was growing, you were also in your career were growing. So how yeah. did that change? Uh, uh, you know, how did you approach it? Yes, of course. Even in the personal level, I, I it grows a family around me also. <laughs> like it was amazing. So it was like everything, you know, my first son uh, was born on, uh, on the release day, 21st of December of uh, 2000. 16 i was the release day of the first season of uh troll hunters like wow a, you know, did you boom, name boom, did you name him jim yeah yeah did no name well, jim? Different, different name but uh but uh definitely was very attached and um you know and olivia was born uh, my 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 younger daughter was born uh during the process as well in um in 2018 so it's those things like uh is growing personally applies to growing professionally and everything is like that feeling of uh, a parallel 
level. That's I, I love that. And uh, what happened is I started as a texture painter. I I was doing feature and even art direction before, but in order to be to you know to travel and to have a work permit and everything, uh, the only position available for troll hunters was a tro uh, texture painter. And I accepted that way because it's, it's nothing like, and, and the people, everyone who actually works on the troll hunters have that kind of vibe of, of, you know, try to help and push boundaries more and more. And that's something like uh, even that one happened to me, like uh, I choose to come here to came uh, to troll hunters as a texture painter because I believe in the project. That moment is special. That moment that like, you feel like you read something or you, they told you something about it. It's like, a, hmm, it's a world that I love to work with or, or be involved and the characters and the moods and the artists, you know, everything that's boom. And what happened is during the Troll Hunters, one of the things like we really have a lot of, um, it was like more a, a, a blank canvas in a way was the lighting. Lighting in TV from before le to uh, Troll Hunters was well, some color keys was done. Honestly, some of the um, some of the um, uh, special moments they they painted lighting, but for us it was very important to have the whole show to have that feeling of a feature like or cinematic lighting, atmospheres and everything, and because it implies. Uh, trolls that actually turns to the stone in the in the sunlight. You need to create that shadows and light and shadows and light and need to be guided in a way. So troll hunters for me was, hey, we can do this, and that's something I I, I you know I remember the first meeting. It was like, a, what are you doing? We are you know that type of thing. Like a, mm, they try to understand what is the color key and how they can implement it on TV a schedule. That is something really tight, as you know. Um, and we managed to do it. And that's the whole turning point from that moment. That was the vendors, the, or the, those uh, different uh, companies who work in the CG and you need to provide the reference. They saw that one, it's like, uh, we want more. And from there, everything started, like explode. Like I, I remember I work on the, honestly, I did all the color keys on Troll Hunters and from three below, the team uh, that when when they when I turned to our direction, then I was able to um, have a more I must say power or responsibilities. So I can select a and this case like Linda Chen, um, uh, Isaac uh, or Love, as, as certain people who actually was there in the art department who actually we can bring some lighting keys and everything. So that was one of the big responsibilities. And also I was art directing, co-art directing with Francisco. That, uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and that was amazing to create that role from that in Three Below. And Wizard, honestly, Wizard was like, a, everything is already settled. We start to have more expertise. We know the, the actual team, how evolve and how grow. And even that team grow a little bit and evolve. And we are able to bring more talented people to the team and that, you know, create more communication between everyone. And I start to understand the, the, the way to communicate with the departments and all that helped to me to grow in a way. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, and coming back to Rise of the Titans, all that groundwork that you guys laid in in the previous three series, um, where you're talking about this lighting in our direction to make it cinematic and feel like a feature, but for television, when you actually did make a feature, this movie, like for me, like someone that had actually worked on the show before, like to me, I was like, it always felt like a movie. It always felt like those big journeys that you go on. Um, so when watching this, it's just like, putting uh, like the final little crown jewel on the series. So again, congratulations on the work um, for this. Um, uh, my last couple questions uh, for you is, as a production designer, what was the biggest goal that you set out to do when for Rise of the Titans? And that's kind of a, a difficult question, but when you knew this project was coming and 
with as you worked with the other producers and executive producers what was the goal because you have the characters from three different series and you have these giant titans and a expanded world because we're not necessarily in arcadia anymore yes. um like how what was the biggest goal that you had to like try to achieve so honestly the big goal is to build everything in the same universe and uh, that's something that because we face it before in two different shows and like a in in three below and um and Camelot in Wizards. This was like a, we we took it in a way like a an opportunity to to show you know those ideas that that because it's a TV show you cannot develop long uh, further away and you need to to restrain yourself. And here it was like more like a now is the moment <laughs> now we can just push the, uh, the boundaries even more no because. You know, in in the whole uh, thing, the people know that we were pushing boundaries, and this this was another of those uh, opportunities. And like the city, for example, you no, know, the beginning of the the movie, that was one of the 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 fir very first environments that we were working. And from that moment, you know, we were my perception always like we were having fun because we we had that security from a team that we were working and works and really compact and tight and you can just say something and they know exactly what to do and and even they they have is kind of a brain tr trust is like a receive uh, uh, receive it and give it so it's like that type of boo, 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 boo. and for example taking that city and say like okay something I, I i wasn't able to do it before because cost and this one is what i got this is it is having the wet grounds, you know, I wet everything because cinematic lighting, if you have a wet ground, that's, you know, boom. Yeah, it looks Change. amazing. It, it looks amazing. So that was my, that was my first thing on my check list here. It was like, a, okay, let's go to, let you give me something to say. Okay. I went with floors. <laughs> like, this is the first, this is first. So it's, it's almost like that. Right. And, um, and that was the fun moment. Even it's a tough um, project because you have a different, uh, like, you know, from a Titan scale to a, a Goblin scale. So those are really big difference uh, between the scales. And that implies a lot of details and elements and then different ones. One of the big difference that, uh, that I enjoy personally is I was able to focus in better in what details need to have there or need to be in there because we have a script. Usually in an episodic, you have a script coming uh, on the go, right? So you go and finish your episode, keep going, and the next one. Even you have a reuse epi uh, environment, here uh, usually you have cameras in areas that you never were there. No, it's like, a, oh, all right, they are using this one. We need to set dress. We need, so you are more like over winging in a way. Here, you have more time to plan. Even the, the time schedule was shorter also. You have time to plan it ahead because you have a script. So from the script, it's more clear. This is the area we're going to be more, and here another one, and all that. Amazing. Yeah, that's great to hear, and I'm, and I'm sure as we also talk to the you know your, the other people on your team, uh, especially you know Linda as well, and also the the CG modelers that help build the world as well, like Jeff and Kundo, uh -huh. we'll we'll get a little bit more insight on their process as well. Um, but again, at first, I just want to congratulate you again. Uh, I know this is a long journey for you, um, and as you mentioned, like you started on Troll Hunters back in 2012. It's now been eight plus years since that. And it's amazing to see the work uh, of everyone, not just yourself, because it, like, as you mentioned, it takes a team uh, to, to see this on the big screen and seeing people enjoy it as well, especially, and I think you know this as well, how much, how passionate the Troll Hunters fan base is as well. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure you're also excited to see some of the fan art coming your way and posted online as well. Yes. So. Yeah, um, be great, yes. So uh, again, thank you for taking the time. Uh, enjoy your time, uh, uh, you know, in, back in Spain for a bit. 
and hopefully we'll uh, we'll be excited to see more of your work and the upcoming projects that you're working on it. So sure. again, thank you, Alfonso. Thank you. Thank you so much. See ya. All right. So that was Alfonso Blas, the production designer of uh, uh, Troll Hunters Rise of the Titans. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here, but again, he was gracious enough to at least do a quick interview and also kind of prep us for the rest of the, the talk. And uh, to bring in the next two guests, uh, we're gonna bring in Linda Chen, who was the art director for Rise of the Titans, and also Francisco Ruiz Velasco, who was the director but also consulted very heavily in the art as well. So uh, Linda and Francisco, if you want to turn on your video. Give it up, applause. <laughs> so before we get into the art, uh, do we want to show the trailer, Lexi? I feel like sure. this would be great to show the trailer before we get right into the arts just so everyone can appreciate in case they haven't seen the movie what we're about to talk about so let's do that real quick all right something's coming a war between mankind and magic dealing with the titans have been awakened it is time don't tell me they're going to destroy the earth quite the opposite they will erase all life they will burn the oceans they will flood the cities that's destroying it we're facing the end of the world so what do we do we got this our team has magic let's go Trolls, aliens, with robots. Can I keep it and take it to school? And Blinky. When we come together, nothing can stop us. Oh, I knew I shouldn't have taken that bathroom break. Here we go. I don't know if we can do this. Please! Turning. Every hero in history has faced dark hours. Wait, are you doing that hero's pitch thing? I love the hero's pitch thing. It's now or never. Yeah! Ha -ha! Go. Godspeed. Oh, come on. I think he may have waved that magic on a This summer, they will rise. Amazing. All right. Well, Lexi, I'll let you take it from here. And uh, excited to hear more about the art. For sure. Thanks, Brian. Well, hi, Linda and Francisco. Welcome back for night two. Glad to have you both here uh, to start. Could you both talk about your art journeys with the trilogy and the movie? So what did you do on, like, what does it mean to be an art director? And so on. Um, yeah, so I started with Troll Hunters um, from the first series. I actually got hired on as a uh, color artist or a paint artist, which is, you know, um, kind of taking model packets and painting those up to look like 3D assets so we can ship them to, you know, our vendors. Uh, I stayed on with the team for afterwards for Three Below and eventually got to be a Viz Dev artist on Three Below. And then for Wizards, um, I guess they liked me enough <laughs> to, to promote me to art director as well. And um, from there on out, I worked with Alfonso to, you know, kind of make sure that our quality bar was just as high for Wizards and the movie and everything is um, history from there.
Yeah, cool. Um, and for me, um, well, I, I was at the beginning, you know, when they started Troll Hunter, this, uh, Guillermo brought me to design characters. Uh, I, I was I was working with Guillermo before I worked on Hellboy and some other movies, and um, and then you know I left. But then when they finished Slow Hunters uh, and they they were planning to start Three Below, they brought me back um, because it was more sci-fi, and uh, I'm a little bit more tuned into the sci-fi stuff. So they brought me back to sign mostly all the sci-fi stuff or like help to flesh out that new part of the series that that wasn't figured out. Um, and then I, I, I think, you know, I, I try, uh, I, I was working remotely at that time, uh, but I was trying to kind of integrate as much as possible with the pipeline. So I was doing like a lot of like simple 3D models for like Jeff and Kundo to start with something. And uh, I think they liked what I was doing. So um, towards the end of the series, uh, they asked me if I wanted to direct a couple episodes. So pretty much I started like getting more into the, more integrated into the show. So to a point that I just stay until the end, you know, until the movie. I mean, on that note, a movie and a series, a whole trilogy takes more than just two people. So I'm going to quickly introduce Jeff and Kundo because these four have some amazing things to show y'all and it'll be so much fun. So Jeff and Kundo, could you come up on stage? <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> welcome to the Zoom. <laughs> I love Zoom, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, would you like to quickly introduce yourself and then? Oh, I could ahead. quickly. Ahead, I could quickly introduce myself, or I could give a story of high adventure that goes on for like an hour and a half. Because <laughs> I drank a lot of coffee and I can talk a lot. Trust me, I can talk a lot. So I'll let Jeff. Do you want me to go first, or do you want to go first? I'll jump in real quick, and then you you can do your 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 high adventure. Uh, mine's pretty quick. I, I'm Jeff. Uh, I, I became a CG, CG supervisor uh, on on Tales of Arcadia. Uh, alongside uh, another CG supervisor, Alex Brennan. Uh, I started in the beginning days of Troll Hunters on season one. Um, I actually wasn't even on the show in the beginning. I, I kind of was working uh, on a show that was being produced right next to Troll Hunters, and I kept looking over and seeing all the cool stuff that everyone was working on for the Troll Hunters show. And, uh, and eventually there was a lull, and I, I got an opportunity to do some uh, work on, on Troll Hunters, and then, and then I just kind of, uh, kind of wormed my way in there. So uh, that's, that's my story of how I joined Troll Hunters. I think Kundo. OK, well, uh, I started many, many, many years ago. Basically, I've been a, I was a practical model builder my entire life. First of all, my name, real name is Facundo Julian Hector Rabaudi. I'm from Argentina, but don't be deceived by my lack of accent. I was brought to the United States at a young age to raise from upstate New York. Um, so I had been, I started off my, I was going to the, going to go to the Culinary Academy because all my artists' friends were working in cafes. I was like, why do I want to go to art school? So I just decided to become a cook, but it turned out I, got hired on Nightmare Before Christmas, James the Trent Peach. I worked on things like Starship Troopers. And then this company called DreamWorks, or at that point, PDI called me, and that was 25 years ago. So I've been there at this company for a long time. And let me just say something about this crew. This is the best crew. And I'm not just saying it because you're all here and I'm being polite. This is the best crew in the, I've ever worked with, the most talented crew I've ever worked with. And I remember when I first saw some of the stuff that needed to get done, I was like, there is no way we can make the show. Absolutely no way. This is going to just fall apart really quick. And it didn't. It's And it's what Alfonso was saying. It's because these people were so passionate about the project. And I'm being dead serious. It, we really enjoyed working on this project. And the people really got along. And we wanted everybody, like, for instance, when I was tired working late nights with Jeff next to me, and there was a problem with the troll market floor. And I'm like, yeah, this is not fun. But you know what? We want to make everybody else look good in our art department. So you work for everybody else. It's kind of that process of like, you want to make everybody happy because you really enjoy everybody and you want to be really proud of this in the end. And I really was. So 
my position is kind of unique because I've always, I've been in the visual development department of DreamWorks the entire times, but I also build CG models. So that's the way I design. And it was kind of one of those things when it came to Troll Hunters that I've been doing these crappy models, just kind of pushing stuff together, but there was such a small crew that it really made you stand out. And it was kind of scary at the time. It was really scary because I'm like, I don't have all these hundreds of other departments to buffer me when the directors and Guillermo are like looking exactly what I'm doing right there on the spot. And it was frightening, but it also inspired me to push myself even harder. So if anything, I think this project was kind of a renaissance for my career because it taught me so much and it pushed me so, it pushed me to my limit in a good way. And I was really, really blessed to be working with this crew. So, you know, I really miss all of you and that's who I am. <laughs> so I can talk for, I can keep going for hours, trust me. <laughs> well, I'm sure we can always go back after this. <laughs> you wanna share your screen? Yeah, actually, before before we do that, I, I kind of wanted to, to kind of uh, prompt Linda and Francisco because you guys were actually in the room with Guillermo when, when like Blue Blue Sky Week kind of launched and kind of all that stuff started. Uh, and then uh, Francisco, Linda was telling me something about uh, some sort of American Idol situation that you oh. that you discussed. Do you, yeah. you guys? Yeah, it's just like um, usually with Guillermo, you know, the, I mean, usually Guillermo hired like so many good artists that pretty much everyone is a monster that we, you know, we need one design, but we end up with like five really great designs that we, we just simply cannot decide which one to pick. So pretty much we just put them all in a board and um, do the American Idol, you know, you vote for your favorite and whoever gets more votes or whatever design, that's the one we pick up. You know, and so we, you know, always when we have that, it's like, Let, let's do an American Idol. What was uh, what was the Blue Sky Week? Because I mean, like, Kuna, Kuna, were you in the Blue Sky Week? No, we were so busy doing uh, That's right. 30 and 5. I remember just looking at that room going. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was kind of intense, you know, because in, in that week, pretty much, we will get into that room with Guillermo. He will explain what he wanted or, you know, a little bit of bits of the story or... At that point, the story is not really like full fleshed out, you know, it's, it's just like ideas and vague uh, concepts. So pretty much all the artists, we just sit down and start like sketching, you know, stuff. And while Guillermo talks and then Guillermo sees something and then, yeah, I like that, but do it like this way or no. And, and sometimes, you know, he needs to do calls or whatever. So he left us for like, like an hour and then you know, we come back after an hour and you're almost checking to see what we have. So it's a little bit uh, uh, stressing, <laughs> stressful, because, you know, Guillermo is going to check in with you really, really constantly or like really often. And, and, and he doesn't expect to see like full flesh out color images, you know, he just wants like doodles and quick ideas. And that's one of the great things to work with Guillermo that you can show him like a sketch in a napkin and he, and, and he knows what to see, you know, like he can say like, oh, that's great. I want that. You know, he doesn't expect to see like, like a masterpiece or like a full flesh, like painting. So that, that's, you know, sometimes he does, but, <laughs> but in those weeks, it's just sketches and ideas, concepts. I think I have his napkin sketch of the layout of a Critian freeway system. Yeah, right. <laughs> were there ever any designs that you were really terrified to show him? Like you, you just weren't sure how he was going to react to it? Uh, well, you know, by, by then I, I was kind of used to that. But uh, yeah, when I started with him the first time, it, it was a little bit, yeah. I mean, more more that, uh, that I was terrorized, I, I was just stressed that that he was probably expecting more stuff. Um, but, you know, but uh, I guess, I guess he likes what I do and that's why I <laughs> keep working with him. Uh, but yeah, sometimes he throws me stuff like, you know, like when we were in The Hobbit, 
sometimes we'll get and tell me, hey, Francisco, you have an hour to do a painting uh, because I need the painting of this thing for the meeting. And, and then he will leave. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I guess I just do whatever I can do in that time. And, you know, but it's always like that working with people. You don't know what's going to happen, but it's always yeah. cool. Yeah, it, it's it always is, scary and exciting. Yeah. It is, it is super scary. And that like reminded me of a story I have actually from Wizards where we were trying to figure out the design for Jim Troll. And we had like gone through so many different artists, so many different designers. And at that time I was still the viz dev, I was still the paint artist or the, the model packet artist. And so like, it came down the line so long that they gave me a shot for it. And Guillermo was there and he, you know, this was, he was in town for a toast that they were gonna have for our show. It was releasing like, it, this was for the third season. And so I like, you know, I was trying to rush out these sketches of Jim Troll but then I got really greedy. So I was like, I'm going to go see what the toast is about. I'm just going to go pop down real quick and see what everyone's doing. And I head downstairs or upstairs. I don't remember if it was downstairs or upstairs. And I get there and then Guillermo spots me and he points at me. He's like, aren't you supposed to be drawing something right now? And I like, I had to run back upstairs and like finish my drawing. And then he came back after the toast. And it was pretty much like the first drawing that I did that, that got approved, like at the end of all that. But it was so scary, scary. Fun times. Um, okay, I guess we should kind of get into some of the some of the TOA stuff. Um, I kind of have some stuff we can kind of uh, kind of get into as far as uh, what we can talk about. I figured. Um, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Okay. That's good, Jeff. So Thank you. I figure the first thing we can talk about is the Titans because that was probably. Uh, one of the more unique and interesting problems that we had. Uh, so I don't know, like from the very beginning, you know, we basically got art from you guys telling us how big and, and crazy these things were. What was like the directive from from like Guillermo about like how big you wanted these things to be? Um, well, I mean, I, I think through the design kind of a stage probably changed like two or three times of sizes you know because usually they start really big and and then it's like hey Guillermo that is like three times this building you know like and then Guillermo okay let's make it 20 20 store tall and then like uh, well you know like maybe that's the right size but it's probably not that big as we want or you know so Pretty much at the beginning, we just, I think we were just fo getting focused on, on just the visual aspect and, and you know, and, and then in, I, I think in the movie, I, in some of the scenes, we kind of cheated a little bit because in some scenes it's bigger and some more, and some others are a little bit smaller. I, I, I guess it just, the goal is just whatever works to create more impact visually. But uh, yeah, but I, I don't think we had like a like a fixed size, you know. It, it, I think right. yeah, because I remember I think the first one we tried, and could, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. The first one we tried was the Ice Titan, right? And uh, and we we built it at scale to one of the one of the uh, original art pieces we got, and it it was it was a little big, right? <laughs> yeah, it was about the size. Yeah, it was. I think it would start to go out in space. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember because we put it in, uh, was it Arcadia that we put it into? And and like yeah. it, the, the foot was the entire size of, of the city. Yeah. Like the, just, just the one foot was, was bigger than the entire city. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, fun times. Um, and then, okay, I guess we could talk about uh, which which uh, which uh, Titans everyone's favorite was. Uh, I think mine is the Fire Titan. I really like uh, lava, and I like the cool like designs and stuff like that. Uh, Francisco, I know what was uh, what were your favorites? Uh, I think this one is my favorite, probably because it's, to me, I I felt it was the most complicated to do. 
this one's my favorite also. Uh, and, and I think it has like more moving parts and, and you know, complexity and layers than the other two. So probably this one, you know. This was uh, this this was one of your designs, right? Originally, Francisco, or uh, how, how, how know, did this come to be? Yeah, well, you know, like when we were doing the, that kind of like blue wig thing, um, I think Sean Murray, no, who, who, you? Andy, it was Andy, 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 exactly, Andy did a sketch that Guillermo liked, and then pretty much, um, you know. Well, as you guys know, uh, we bounce the signs between us artists, you know, like, so Andy did it. And then Guillermo asked me to, to give it a shot. So pretty much I took it and, you know, tried to do a pass. And, and then, uh, you know, I mean, I don't remember how many artists did a pass on this guy because, you know, I, I, I was with one foot in directorial and the other one in art. But uh, yeah, but I, I remember it was like coming and com you know, going and coming several times and, and you know, like tweaking details and doing the stuff. Yeah. So yeah, this, but, Titan, this Titan definitely like scared the design department the most in terms of execution because of all the foliage that's involved on it. And it, I, I couldn't be happier with the way it turned out. And I love the design. Yeah, the CG side of things. This was this was pretty scary when we first <laughs> when we first saw it, just because it's it's so big, it's moving, it's got all these vines and and and, and foliage that has to kind of like shake with it, you know, moving and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, our partner studio, you know, came up with a really good system for kind of simulating a lot of that stuff uh, with curves and Houdini. So it was uh, they managed to get it done, but it was it was a complex beast for sure. <laughs> um let's see yeah and this this was my favorite titan uh one, one kind of interesting thing was uh this this this, this series had so many like big effectsy things throughout the the whole series i want we try to reduce a lot of complexity uh and one of the things we actually managed to do is uh with these kind of sigils that float above the uh the, the titan's faces uh we actually did that instead of using like uh, traditional effects, we kind of just built a, a, a fancy shader that would kind of like do the effects automatically. So it was almost like, instead of it being made out of wood or metal, it was made out of like this like dynamic fire thing. Uh, so that was a really fun little challenge that kind of helped us out with a lot of these shots. So removed one, one extra effect from all the shots. And uh, for some of these, like this shot in particular, like, you know, there's a lot happening here. There's smoke coming out of the top of him. There's water splashing around. There's steam coming off of the water. <laughs> it's, it's just a lot. So we were looking for every every kind of like spot we could to kind of reduce reduce the effects counts. Uh, do you guys have any more uh, stories or thoughts on the on the Titans? Yeah, well, I, I remember this one was, uh, you know, pretty much that reveal scene. It was really difficult to do because it starts on the water and then the camera rises above water and you keep, you know, continue, look, you know, looking at the Titan and, uh, and, it, and it was really challenging just to frame because it was like so big that sometimes it, it, it will obscure the whole camera and, and then, you know, we wanted to have like, like a little bit of a transition when the camera breaks the water so we needed like some bubbles before and it was really really complicated that scene it, it took us at least a couple months just to get it right yeah and well and in terms of the design um this one was the only titan that besides you know the exterior look we we wanted to to build a like an in, inside arena just to have the final battle right so so it was almost like another environment within this titan yeah that's something we ended up doing on the cg side of things for a lot of these these kind of pieces is that we had like the overall titan build uh and like the character rig so that he can move around and stuff like that but for all these like scenes where they're like fighting on the titans and stuff like that we had to we had to create these like close-up sets just to kind of make those shots work and some of them were like a little bit of a cheat, but a lot of them were actually pretty close to like what the what the Titan would have been. 
uh, if we were just using it. But just from a practicality standpoint, we couldn't we couldn't just make the entire thing super super high res and super super detailed. So we had to kind of break it up into into bite sized chunks. Um. And then Francisco, here, here's the uh, honor, honorary Titan, the honorary fourth Titan. Exactly, yeah, yeah, you have to include this guy because I, I feel that you cannot talk about the Titans without including this robot. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to talk first a little bit of that, Jeff, or you want me to kind of talk a little bit too. Um, I mean it, well, the design process was interesting with this guy because he had a lot of like complex, you know, systems and, and kind of mechanics that kind of worked out. But but we were lucky to have you just go because you, you were able to kind of like think through a lot of this stuff because you come you come to the table with the with the with the modeling skill sets. So you were able to kind of like rough out a lot of this stuff and figure it out. And you did a lot of nice technical drawings to kind of show how the different weapons would like deploy and unfold and yeah, you know, one, one thing that happened when we were developing this Titan is that, or this robot, is that in the in the show, in the series, we we have some glimpses of Gun Robot, but the robot from the show, it always looks a little bit retro, you know, like, like yeah, like a more like retro design, more in the, in the territory of the Iron Giant kind of thing. So I remember when we started designing, Alfonso was telling me it needs to look like the one on the show. And, and I was telling him all like all the time, you know, I don't like the one on the show. I, I, I mean, it looks too retro, you know, it, it doesn't feel like an Acridian will build a robot like that way. And, and, and for a time there was always that discussion, you know, like where, you know, what direction to go. And I don't know if you remember, guys, I did a few designs of the robot like looking retro, but I, I never liked it because it looked like an action figure, just like oversized. And um, and at some point, uh, I don't know if it was Guillermo or the producer, but pretty much they told me like, it, it was almost like I was unleashed, like, you know, like just do whatever you want. And like, yeah, and I, start designing this guy, you know? Yeah, I think um, this guy to me is a really great example of when not to take certain shortcuts. Cause I remember in developing this guy, we, you know, because he's got a lot of transparency in his outer shell. So we were like, okay, can we hide the interior? So we don't have to do as much. And I feel like our attempts to make it kind of easier to do did have an impact on the overall look. And so when we actually committed to like doing kind of like a more intense interior for it, just to pay it off on screen, I think that it, it really, it really made the design and sometimes like it's not worth it to take a shortcut. So I'm really glad that we were able to translate like Francisco's design kind of with more integrity, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this one was uh, was a complicated thing from from the CG side of things too, because I, I we we were trying to figure out the best way to do it, and like, the, like it, it, you can't tell it in every shot, but you, I think you can kind of sense it. Uh, there's actually like an entire like substructure underneath this like outer like serrated gelatin kind of uh, exterior of, of of gun robot. So like we you know we went to town kind of like building out like the the like kind of interior mechanics of it and you know we, we relied heavily on the art team to kind of design that stuff. Because one one of the main ideas that uh, we want I you know that we wanted is to to make it look somehow similar to Bex, you know, how Bex also has like the transparency in the chest and all that. So, so we wanted to make believable that Bex will drive like this kind of machine, you know? And uh, so, so that's why we decided to go with all those transparent or translucent materials and all that stuff. It was also really nice for, for when he was taking damage too, because all that stuff kind of came into play as, as the lava was like melting away the outer layers and he was getting beat up, so. That that complexity did end up paying dividends as as we started to destroy the beautiful robot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and you know, and I, I, I think it was a cool idea to have the head as, as a skateboard kind of thing, too. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of... Uh... A lot of our characters ended up going through some sort of evolution as we as we kind of got from you know went from the TV series into the movies uh, on the on the on the kind of you know more mundane side of things we had to kind of like we had all this backlog of characters that we had kind of developed uh, you know from the beginning of Troll Hunters all the way to to you know through Three Below and Wizards and uh, as we were as we were kind of going through series to series we ended up having to kind of uh, update our technology a lot we were you know updating to new versions of the render and, and having to like update shaders as we went along too. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things we had to do that was kind of uh, interesting for this project was kind of synchronize everything to kind of work together again, because again, like there's a lot of stuff that troll hunters had that just never, that we hadn't seen since troll hunters. Uh, and, and so we had to kind of like grab all this stuff collected together and kind of make sure that it all kind of worked together in the same uh, ecosystem. So there was a lot of work. We had, we had a really good surfacing artist, uh, Marine Liu, who put a lot of effort into kind of like bringing all of our characters into the same kind of uh, feel and like making sure that they would light properly. Uh, and then we had also some pretty dramatic changes as far as, you know, Jim got his new armor and, and kind of Eli had his, his glow up. Uh, you know, so I figure, Linda, you could probably talk about Eli's blow up for sure, and then we can um, kind of get into Jim's armor. I mean, I I really when when we were pitched the idea of the Eli glow up, I was really happy just because um, I I really wanted to glow him up, I guess. <laughs> and so when that, I just remember like being told that he needs to be still like a little bit, you know, the old Eli, a little dorky, but like you know he puberty has done him well let's just put it that way so one of the actors that I actually referenced was uh John Krasinski for it but like a younger version and I you know it, it's just fun to kind of like have a new take on characters but uh what's funny about this Eli design though is that when I first uh showed the writers I remember the the note that I got back was that it looks too much like old Eli and I was like really does it though and I, I thought I was like I was missing the mark and then like finally you know I didn't do any real changes to him but I did put him next to old Eli just to see like the difference from old Eli and new Eli and then then they were like oh yeah that's that's not Eli oh well, that's not the same Eli anymore so I you know I, I was really happy with the the way the concept turned out after that and also, like, it was really fun doing the Acridian babies. There's this one concept, though, that, that Francisco did of an Acridian baby that is my favorite that I don't have access to. And I was hoping Francisco would have put it in here, but I don't think we'll see Worm Baby. Sorry for that, Linda. I, I really like that baby. Did you like that baby looks more like a, like a larva or something like that? Yeah, but um, that's... that's I feel like that that makes sense though for for the acridians if they're like kind of like uh, transparent skin and you know, I, I liked it. Yeah, probably Guillermo thought it was it was too um, and too weird or maybe too bizarre. I don't know, but it was mm -hmm. funny. Yeah, it was really funny. Yeah, I mean, there's pregnant Steve, but <laughs> the worm baby's too weird. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, what was like? What was the design process for uh, for for Jim's new armor? Because that's kind of a you know like, that's like a fun kind of pull together of, of you know like liter quite literally of of, uh, of three below and, and troll hunters. Yeah. So this piece actually was kind of um, a tag team. The first pass was taken uh, by Sam Drummond, one of our viz dev artists, who actually designed the new armor. So you know he took the first pass, and then I I basically like try to because at that point we had several different languages for magic and for like acaridian technology so i took that base concept and i kind of like tried to add more of the acridian flair and the entire team like design team is a huge fan of like kind of 2d effects and anime effects i, I feel like you guys can tell from the uh, wizards opening title that you know that oftentimes like we do some things like that so 
I wanted to add some of those uh, very anime-esque like white flames to it. And even though I don't think this is 100% what shows up on screen, it was still super fun to paint. It turned out it turned out great. No, I mean, I, I I loved it. Uh, I thought it was a good uh, good pull together. Uh, okay, this is this is Kuno's section here because uh, Kuno was tasked. Uh, one one of the things that made this show challenging was that there's just so many dang locations, you know, because we're you know we're like in New York, we're in Brazil, we're in the desert, we're in in, a, in an a, a harbor in Asia, you know, it, it just took place all over the place. So we had we were fortunate enough to have Kuno on board to kind of like fill out a lot of these locations. Uh, so I, I guess we would start with, uh, you know, where the film starts, which is Metro City, which is, you know, an entire, you know, New York City that we, we had nothing for uh, until Kudo <laughs> came along. Well, yeah, this was like, first thing, when, I just want to say, I go crazy when I do these sets. Like I, I'm fortunate enough that when I'm in these productions, I literally dream of these environments because I spend so much time in it. Like I know every nook and cranny, every alley, every little piece of garbage that fits into here because I'm physically placing it in there. Um, this was a really fun project to do just on the sense that it was different from a Critian, but because we, like what um, Alfonso was saying is we had a script, whereas a Critian and Arcadia we had to design, I mean, we literally designed the entire town, city where you could drive from one block to the next. Like you can drive from Jim's house all the way to the museum, like it was a video game. So it was cool about this is we knew exactly where we were gonna be and I didn't have to build an entire city. But I kind of fleshed it out to the point where I did, like there's ridiculous amount of detail that we never even saw. So when we saw it on the screen, I was like, oh my God, that's it, that's it. <laughs> I put all that little garbage on the street. So I was really happy the way it turned out. And there's a lot of interesting jokes in the billboards here. Uh, for instance, um, chips keep on crunching. These are all just weird moments that we had in the art department with weird, uh, weird little inside jokes. So that's a whole nother discussion. And there's that beautiful wet asphalt that Alfonso wanted to make everything look really good. And there's a, uh, I think that's Alfonso's uh, butcher pig right there, like everything in here. There's such such a personal touch in this city from all the people in the art department. And this was such a fun set to build. It was also built modular so I could pick up a whole block of the city and rotate it and it would line up to another block so we could cheat it. So it looked like they were actually driving further than we were, but the actual set was pretty big. And there was a lot of overtime on this, a lot of weird staring at screens. <laughs> Uh, this is an alley. This was something that every troll hunter show had an alley in it. And I was never happy with the alleys that we had from troll hunters, from wizards, the three below. So finally, we got a really nice looking alley. And this was just, I've spent a lot, not too much time in these city alleys, but I definitely spent some time in the alleys. So I wanted to be so real that I could smell the dampness of the cigarette butts and everything. So we wanted a lot of the garbage and I hand placed all that little garbage there and the trash bags. It was just a really fun set to build. And for instance, a lot of these buildings are actually from Arcadia. We just put uh, fire escapes on them to make them look more urban. We, we cut and pasted and took other objects from a lot of other buildings and put a lot of new shaders on them. Next one. And here's the alley, how I would usually see it before I hit the render button. And there's the motorcycle that I don't know if we ever really saw. <laughs> yeah, for some reason they keep removing it, right? I know, we built it. It was, there are so many secret things that we would just put in here, just hoping they were gonna get in there. But the motorcycle was one of them. Uh, it was definitely a fun thing to have. I think yeah. that's, I, I, I mean, Dukesy was I, supposed I, to ride it. Yeah, actually, yeah. I, I don't think anyone knows that story from the set you and me. <laughs> but when we were developing uh, Wizards, I wanted Duxy to have like those kind of race, uh, cafe racer motorcycles outside his coffee shop. Uh, but for some reason, they never let me have it. You know, we have it there and then they remove it. And, I know. And then um, I... You know, uh, I wanted to have like a 
like some action with Duxi in his motorcycle in the movie, and they also removed that scene from there. So, yeah, I, uh, the motorcycle was always the night. It was, and it was so funny because that's just how this project was, is where Francisco would come over and go, can you make a motorcycle? And I would go, yeah, I could probably do that. And then it'd be kind of under the radar and it would just show up. <laughs> And then someone's like, why is that motorcycle there? And there's, some, there's a lot of things like that in this project. There's a lot of weird secret stuff that I could get into, like pigeons and stuff like that. They're just in, inside jokes for the art department, but yeah. Yeah, I, actually in the movie, when R and Duxi are chasing the air titan, or in the original storyboards, R had, I think on his back, um, no, it was R, and then there was Luke, and and no Enrique was riding Luke, and then Duxi was in his motorcycle, <laughs> and all of them were chasing the Titan. But then you know, for kind of simplifying purposes, we just decided to have Duxi riding or you know, like on top of our chasing the Titan. Yeah. Yeah. So there it sits in the corner forever, in, frozen in time in this alley. And I think that's Strickler's car at the end of the alley. So that was just a suspicious looking car down there. So. Mm -hmm. This was a subway uh, that I worked with Linda a lot on. And I've been in a lot of subway stations. And it was just a fun set to build. And we actually ended up using a lot of this for other sets, like for the Acridian. Um, when they're on the castle, they're planning, when they're in Camelot, the science fiction the set. So we use a lot of these props and assets. At one point, I think there was rats running along the sewer, uh, down on the tracks, but I don't think they made it into the movie either, but I really wanted to put rats in there. But this was another one of those sets that I spent a lot of time making it look exactly like a subway because I definitely have spent some time in subways and that was the thing is I always paid attention to every environment that I'm in because you never know when you're going to have to design something like this and working with Linda on this set was great because I remember Linda going I designed this really cool whole lower part and Linda's like well how are we going to light it so <laughs> so we put all the lights in there and yeah this one would make me really happy yeah I I think uh the the train tracks were the same ones that go outside too right so we read yep. re so many elements of this set and i have to say though like um doing model packets over your models is a joy and a breeze rather than like you know doing traditional model packets where like you have to draw the line art and being able to work with a cg artist oh my gosh lifesaver no i mean like i said this stuff is so fun to do like just like you said the, the garbage cups the little debris and that was one thing that um, Rodrigo, right off the bat, said when I first started working, he said, I don't want this to look like a typical CG show. I want to put debris on the ground. I don't want to see just a flat surface go into another flat surface. I want it to feel like it's lived in, it has some history to it. So that was the approach I did too. Even the debris on the tracks, I put that down in there just because I know that that's what would be there. Mm -hmm. uh, such fun memories. Another view. Oh, the guitar. So I would picture like some crazy guy just playing a guitar down there with a cup or a hat. That was another thing I just added. And I think that's, I don't know who's, I don't even know where we got that guitar from, but it was definitely something you would definitely see. And there's so much garbage on this floor and not enough. Yeah, I vaguely remember, was it Betsy who was working on the guitar? Someone had the guitar as an assignment, but I don't remember what it was for. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah, that's fun too, because like that kind of set dressing is is the kind of set dressing that kind of like ends up motivating animation a little bit, because you know, you, you you give this set to an animator, and, and and like if they see that hat in the guitar there, they're not just gonna put somebody standing there; they're gonna do something fun with it. Exactly. You know? Although we didn't get anybody on the phone booth, because that was the funny thing is like, how often do you actually see phone booths anymore? But I put right. a cup on a cup on the top because there's always someone putting a cup on the top of the phone booth, so. Nice little touches. And then we have the police station too, obviously a, another kind of key set. Yeah, this 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 was another one that was, I mean, they're all fun. There's a lot of 
yeah, I don't have a lot to say about this, but this is a police station and it was fun to build. We did some rearranging. This is an example of, a, I mean, more the interior than the exterior, but this was, an, this was a set where we kind of like did a, did a rough model, like an art model for it to kind of get things going. And then the storyboard artists kind of had to stage things in specific ways for the story. And so we had to kind of like tear apart the inside and like kind of re renovate oh, yeah. the entire thing to kind of make it work with the boards. So that's kind of like an interesting uh, like interplay that actually happens fairly regularly. I mean, we'll, we'll kind of put things together and then we'll have to tear them apart to, to rearrange them to kind of make them work for the story. Uh, so, you know, it happens, but, uh, you know, fortunately we caught it early enough because uh, we had you on board to do the, the kind of models for it. Yeah, it was really fun. And notice the monkey with the tambourine. That's from one of Jeff's models from uh, Three Below. I don't know, <laughs> know which one, where that came that's, from. <laughs> that's from the uh, Krell's original uh, Daxial Array, you know, like when, when he yeah, kind of think, custom built it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think in the store shop, they were building like this cannon or something or... Yeah. And yeah, because I remember I, I designed that cannon for Three Below and and Rodrigo told me because the first is the first, my first design was like too high tech and he said like no 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 it needs to be built like like found objects you know they just put together so I yeah so I like okay let's put that monkey there and uh, yeah and that monkey got used so it's it's in a couple places people the fans have to kind of find it but I would <laughs> I would always scour all the stuff that everybody was doing going oh, what, what can I do this where can I take that where can I put this so that was the reason we were able to really flesh out this world is we cannibalized every little aspect of this over and over and over again I think there was one rock that we used in every show called uh, potato chip rock but that's another story also the donut was... the donut box is another fun story <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell it I don't I, it's it's yeah, it's all right. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what you said though, Kundo, is absolutely true. I mean, th things like the found objects, assets, th those are gold mines for us because we can just, we, we build it for, for the specific, you know, shot or, or asset. And then we, you know, as you said, we cannibalize it. We just pull it apart and we create a bunch of separate assets for it and just throw it throughout our world, scatter it throughout our world. So, I mean, you'll, you'll see a lot of, if you pay really close attention throughout, you know, Troll Hunters through, uh, through the movie, uh, you'll, you'll see stuff that, you know, kind of here and there that you're like, oh, that was part of that, or that was, you know, in this other set or something like that. So, you know, it was kind of one of the ways that we were able to kind of like work so quickly and, and kind of uh, still try to like fill up our worlds a bit. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that was Strickler School Desk. You know, th there's a lot of assets in here. A nice motivational poster. Oh yeah, you gotta have those. <laughs> Betsy did such a good job on all the uh, graphics. Yeah, that's a, that's another thing that I would also say both about uh, the kind of billboards and stuff like that, but also the uh, the interiors and stuff like that is is that you know it was something that Alfonso and, and Linda were pushing early on was just like populate the world with graphics and it'll, it'll make everything feel a lot more alive and, and lived in and it, it really makes a huge difference uh, at the end of the day. I mean just. You know these great portraits in the background. You know, just brings a lot of life to the to the police station, and it's not just you know some generic police station. It now feels like there's like specific officers who work here, and it's just very nice. Yeah, those um officers specifically was uh, I believe it was Sean. Sean did those, and then Betsy did a lot of uh the like I think from Wizards like the the one I like the most is she did Baby Archie coming out of the egg like <laughs> all time graphics in the show so. Those two really came in clutch. Some of them were my favorite. Yeah, this was the original police station was done by a concept from John Bell. He was a, he is an amazing, talented production designer. I worked with him on Ants. He worked on Rango. It, yeah, working from his artwork was always inspiring. He's also the fourth dimension fourth dimension consultant for Contact. That's his, that the best movie credit <laughs> I ever saw. <laughs> More than Jurassic Park. Jurassic. Park. I, yeah, Jurassic Park is good, but fourth dimension consultant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving out of uh, out of there, I mean, again, one of the challenges was that we had these titans rising all over the 
the planet. So we had all the different kind of locations scattered throughout the world. Uh, and, you know, Kuno, you did a lot of this, so, you know, yeah. take it away. Yeah. But th this is a beautiful Arctic station you have here. Yeah, the, this is a hybrid of a bunch of stuff that was grabbed, like the radar dish is from the military base from Francisco on three below, the towers. And actually, the actual base is made out of the three below containment thing where they were holding, uh, I forgot which character, it was like a see-through room. Oh, it was, it was Tronos. Trono, yeah, so we just put a different texture on it. So I was able to stack it. Like I just looked at, I, I, when I would design this, I looked at this as if I was digging through a junk box with all the stuff that I had to make something. So that's kind of how these sets were. These are, this is completely just taken from other parts of our show. Like there's a cargo container, you know, I think the ladders from the high school, there's just so much stuff. And this was really fun. And I can let you now know that the movie's out is there's a logo on here called FNG, which is my Friday night game group. <laughs> That's and then we had yeah. oh my god yeah <laughs> so this was a this was a pretty significant chunk of your of your life <laughs> yeah this was <laughs> it was so it was fun and crazy at the time this was a lot of overtime when i think about this i just picture myself sitting at my desk at night uh, just want, I could hear story artists in the other room kind of like listening to music, but it was a very surreal experience because I did do this a lot late at night. So Looking up, it, go ahead. Yeah, no, it was fun until it wasn't, right? Exactly, exactly. It wasn't fun when we started to like realize how big this was and it all had to be made and they were going to fly through and where they're going to fly through. Because this was one of the sets we didn't know where we were going to shoot at all. So I kind of just built I took Google Earth and started building Hong Kong and then we adjusted it. <laughs> yeah, but later, I, I remember I did, um, to help you on your grief, I, I did like a like a concept painting and a little like map of yep. that column where everything was located. That, and, those maps were golden. They made me yeah, so happy. Thank you. I'm going to shoot in this location. I, I don't mind whatever you do around, it's just this location. Uh, it was, yeah, this was fun. And then this, this was kind of like everybody in the art department ended up working significantly on this shot. So I'm really, and it was really beautiful how it turned out. Really, really beautiful. I was so happy when I saw it on the screen because I honestly didn't see any of this because I finished working on it before a lot of the stuff was finished. So I was blown away how, by the end result. So Linda, Francisco, Alfonso, you guys did an amazing job with this. I think this was another example of, of, of the, the Titan scale issue. But uh, I think one of my favorite things is you built this like bridge to scale and we had this sequence of storyboards where like gun robots getting pushed up against the bridge and like the Titans are kind of fighting along the bridge. Uh, and then we pulled the pulled one of the, the, the original scaled Titans into this, this set. And, and again, his foot was like bigger than the, you know, like one foot was, you know, wider than the, the entire uh, gap uh, that the bridge spans across. And so it, it kind of changed like, oh, well, if this is actually the size that the Titan is, then this bridge is not going to stop this Titan at yeah. all. The world's going to be in a very sad place if that was the scale. Yeah, I think it came up to his knee, right? The highest part of the bridge. Right, right, like right here. <laughs> yeah. And then this is a, this is a fun uh, model based off of something in, in real life that you've seen? Uh, I do a lot of... Uh, driving in creepy little roads. Um, so this was kind of a place that I saw. And it was one of those places where you would find weird Polaroids of things inside. So it was just a very creepy gas station. But the funny thing is Francisco, here's a little thing about that car. See the car there is Francisco had bought a car that looked just like that. <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a young Alfa Romeo that I, I decided to restore. And, uh, but it was like so bad, you know, in so much shape that, uh, yeah, I guess they were like mocking at me about that and decided no. to put it there. Yeah, we put it in there. I mean, this was a really fun set just because it was like very contained and it wasn't an entire city. So I could kind of just really focus on this one location. For instance, a lot of this is made from the drive-in movie theater set from Three Below. A lot of it is made from that. Yeah. 
But guess what? That car is not that junk anymore. Oh, probably oh man, it. there it is. I was going to yeah. ask him. But now what? it's pink. Now it's, paint, it's painted <laughs> and finished. That is beautiful. I didn't think that's like truly a phoenix rising from the ashes because there, there, there were plants growing out of that thing <laughs> <laughs> and bullet holes in it. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well done, Francisco. I'm glad you, I'm glad you got it there. Does, does it actually run yet or is it, is it, uh, no, uh, an engine. no all, all the cosmetic is done. It's just the engine and mechanic stuff, restoration that is need to do. But uh, halfway through, <laughs> now it doesn't look like a junk car anymore. It looks better than this one here. That's for sure. All right, I guess we can start to talk about uh, one of the one of the big sets we did was the Stone Carver's Troll Market. We can play the quick intro real quick. So I guess uh, the first question for for Linda and Francisco is, you know, wh where did where did we start with all of this? You know, like we got the script, we we were told that there's going to be a new troll market. You know, what happened? What happened after that? Um, well, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this one, Linda. I just remember at the very very beginning, there was like a few troll markets. Uh, Guillermo wanted a few, but then at the end, we just decided to do this one. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. It, it's honestly, the design on this, this whole thing was honestly kind of a blur to me just because we were going so fast. I remember um, in Blue Sky Week, we all had kind of like a few passes on it. I remember Francisco, you had a, a couple of VizDev paintings. And I think um, the way we ended up approaching it. And I think Jeff, you're a big driver of this is like kind of kit bashing it together by building, you know, these segments of it that we could rearrange for the shot and like figure out. And I remember like a few ideas that, you know, remained the same the whole way through like the, the round bridges. I think that was always a motif that we all liked from the beginning. And uh, one of our viz dev artists, Aaron um, Loftus was the one who actually designed a lot of uh, of like the little buildings and bridges and stuff to to kind of populate the area. And then I think like at some point, it was honestly Jeff that like took everything, all these little pieces and like cobbled it together into this like amazing vista that you see now from all of these like different ideas. So it was, it was, it's really cool to see from, from beginning to end. Yeah, I mean, when I started working on this, there was so much stuff that you guys had done as far as, you know, art pieces. There was like little vignettes, little bridges and buildings and stuff like that. It was, it was, it was like just so, it was almost overwhelming how much stuff you guys had like put together to kind of like start to explore it. Um, hold on, let me see. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty crazy. I'll, I'll get to it in a second, but Francisco did actually have this idea for building like a central like city block of like, uh, actually, let, let's just do it real quick. Um, for uh, here, this is actually just a quick like little fly through of the, of the model itself. Uh, this was a really fun uh, collaboration too with our creative partners. They, they, they helped us a lot. Um, CGCG CG did a lot of the, the work on this stuff. So we, we kind of put together kind of like what, what Kendo does with art models. And then we kind of worked with our studio to kind of fill out the sets and stuff like that. Um, but this, this idea that, that, that Francisco had was to kind of like, instead of like worrying about kind of like building out everything as like unique and special parts is to kind of like focus on like, what is the core like city element kind of look like? And so Francisco had me put together kind of like this, this little like section of, of, uh, of the troll market. And, and then we kind of uh, focused on that as like oh, a central piece. And then we kind of like framed the entire area with different versions of this kind of central block. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was. I think we were calling them like Iceland's, right? Like yeah, like this is the main main Iceland, and then you know from there everything is kind of based on. And and one what one of the main difference that we we wanted to have to kind of to put it apart from the other troll market under Arcadia is that on this one we we wanted to have that extra layer or like industrial uh, elements. So that's why you see a lot of pipes and, you know, and probably ACs and, or like machines and stuff that you right. don't see in the electro markets. Yeah, because there was this kind of idea with, with this market that there was kind of like an older civilization that kind of lived here and built these kind of like bigger stone pieces, like the big circles and stuff like that. And then there's like the kind of newer, you know, troll population that kind of is building the mechanical stuff on top of all of that. So that's where they, they kind of get these like pipes coming out of these kind of ancient, you know, blocks of stone and whatnot. Yeah, and a, a little bit of a uh, spawn of that idea is that, you know, city I was living in Mexico, uh, you can see a little bit of the, that kind of layering that you see all buildings uh, that, you know, that through the years, instead of being properly repaired and upgraded, they're much just like patched up. So you see like, buildings from the 40s then on top they have like pipelines that probably they burst inside but it was like so expensive to fix them inside that they run into the outer walls to fix them and then they fitted like ac units on top so so it's like all these juxtaposed of like you know like layers that you can see the history of that building or through the, those layers that it has on top. It was a little bit the, the main kind of where the, this idea started coming from. And it was it was actually really fun to build that way too, because you you know, like when we were building the putting the model together, it was a lot of like building out like what was what was the original kind of uh structure first and then kind of adding in those those kind of like renovations, so to speak, uh, of kind of adding the the pipes and the utilitarian kind of pieces to it. Um, real quick, before we go any further, I do want to, I do want to bring up this, uh, part, one, one of the things that we always kind of hit in CG is, is like, we can build these big cities, but then, you know, if, if there's nobody in them, they, they kind of feel empty and, and lackluster. So, uh, one of the things that, that Linda kind of took charge on was kind of like setting up, a you know, a cast of background characters for this. And they ended up being really, really interesting. Uh, so I don't know, Linda, do you, do you have a... Any, any comments or thoughts on, on this? Uh, I mean, I just, like, one, one of the things that I, I really try to be very conscious of is that um, since Troll Hunters, one of the biggest influences were our character design team from Troll Hunters, like Headless Studios. And so my mind going in on this was, how do I make dragon trolls but still kind of evoke that same headless vibe? And that was, like, I guess the most challenging part for me. And I, I made a I made a comment once that uh, I was going to just make um, Chinese zodiac trolls, and then I thought about this turtle troll, and then that went out the window because there's actually not a turtle zodiac, guys. So that is no longer the case. Right on. Uh, well, thank you because that really helped fill out our, our world. Um, I think that I just want to go through a couple of these. We had a really talented uh, lighting artist work with us, Jonathan Ketelin, um, who he, he's he's worked on a few of our our shows throughout the the, the series, and um, he, he's like really instrumental in kind of like breathing life into the like the lighting and the look of things. We kind of like worked with him as like a look of picture kind of artist. So we put together our models and our sets. And we gave it to him to kind of experiment with lighting. And he, he kind of brought a lot of really cool ideas that were kind of, you know, things that we had talked about internally. Some of them were his ideas as well. And we were just kind of, he's able to kind of bring them all into like a, a real kind of space. So he did these series of renders for us that kind of like show off kind of what we were kind of going for, for the overall market. And there's like a lot of cool stuff that he that he was able to integrate into it. Like the, the, the caustics of the water, we kind of wanted, to give the sense that this is underground and it's kind of wet and damp. And he, I think he was able to kind of uh, 
captures that really successfully. So I, I thought, you know, we, we have to show his. Yeah, one, one, of the, one of the ideas is that if you go to the lower levels, it's like flooded. And that that's why we wanted those caustic lights. Which also explains why there's so much piping, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then fx linda take it away uh yeah so um i feel like the effects like in in the movie specifically that like, we really kind of went like balls out and effects are one of those things that i think if done well can can really uh up the up the quality of your product and there's so many effects to talk about because like the water, you know, is an effect. The the waterfall from the Earth Titan, that's also an effect. So this is just like the tip of the iceberg. But uh, I really enjoyed designing this effect specifically because I really worked closely with the storyboards that I got from it and working with Joanne to figure out the timing of uh, when, you know, when this effect should be on the screen and how large it should be and what information it should be giving because as you all know, this is when Blinky narrates like how the Titans are actually going to destroy the Earth. So, but this is like not even one percent of all the effects work in this in this movie, honestly. Yeah, you guys did an amazing job. There's a lot of stuff that's like difficult to kind of like realize in hindsight that you that you needed. And and one of the things was like you know like the lava blast coming out of the fire Titan. You know, there's a, there's a lot to spell out there because it's it wasn't just like shooting lava normally it was kind of like this like la almost laser beam of lava so like having the art team kind of figure that stuff out ahead of time was really really helpful mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of the lava effects were done by again uh aaron loftus he really got like the viscosity of it down i think in his um in his in his like passes so that really drove almost all the effects for for the fire titan yeah um I think, and then the last thing we want to talk about, last but certainly not least, was the the beautiful, beautiful color keys uh, that that you guys did in the art department. It was uh, from from a CG side of things, it, it makes things really, really easy for us to kind of give us a very specific target to hit. And and when you guys capture like the cinematic look in these in these color keys, it, again, it just gets us it gets us most of the way there before we even you know open the scene to start you know lighting and CG. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do want to say that like a lot of the color keys are kind of like team efforts also. Um, for example, the top right one on this page with uh, Nari's plant, that was actually first started by Sean. Um, I just uh, adjusted a few small things because unfortunately Sean had moved on to a new show at that point and, uh, you know, just kind of working all together. And I cannot emphasize how in, like instrumental Alfonso was in this entire process he really had such a clear idea of not only like how to make it feel cinematic, but also how to convey story and emotion in all of these beats. Like he was the main presence. And of course, like, you know, the, the approval process goes through all the directors as well. So, you know, each director was able to kind of also um, have input on their scenes as well, depending on like, you know, which act the color keys go into. And, uh, my my personal favorite part of the movie to work on was like kind of the climax and the fight with uh with Bellrock on the actual Titan because those were the most challenging as well when I started them we only had kind of like layout shots to work off of because you know sometimes you get really lucky and you get like a really nice render like the police station to kind of do your color keys over and then sometimes you you just have the bare storyboard or the layout and it was really fun challenging myself in that way. And like, of course, nothing could get past Eagle Eye Alfonso if it wasn't. <laughs> so I'm, I was very happy to learn from him. Right on, right on. Uh, I think that's it for, for the basic uh, kind of presentation that we have. Um, I think, uh, Lexi, we can kind of open it up to QA if you're ready for that. Yeah, definitely, let's do it. So first off, that's, it feels like, or everything you showed us is what love looks like. Like you all put so much into these worlds and so much time. I mean, it's so astounding. It's such an honor to see that. Um, otherwise for questions, um, 
I had my list up and I lost it. <laughs> I, I have one. I think we, we can keep the questions at two, uh, like two questions and keep the Q&A kind of short because you, I guess, I think you covered everything as the questions were coming in, but um, I would say for, for all of you, um, because we have a lot of people that are attending this talk that are interested in a career such as yourselves, like, I guess, what is one piece of advice as either someone that's looking to be an art director or look, work in visual development or work in CG modeling that you would like uh, the viewers or the attendees to know? Um, Jeff, do you want to start kick it off? Yeah, I mean, I can give, I can give the advice that was actually given to me at, uh, when I graduated from from uh, from school. Uh, I went to I went to the Noman School of Visual Effects, and we we had uh, so so our, our commencement speech was very like you know uh, effects and animation kind of centric. Uh, but despite that, uh, our, our speaker kind of told us to just be a good person, uh, which. Sounds really ridiculous, especially when you're coming out of school and you're so worried about like getting your skills up and, and kind of working really hard and, and, and kind of making really awesome art. But you know that that's all very important. That's all kind of like a baseline skills that you have to have coming into into the field. But you know if if you are a person that can you know work with others and and kind of like keep your focus about like making the project better as opposed to kind of like you know flexing your own skills or anything like that. Uh, that, that goes really, really far. And I, I think um, for, for, I think one of the things that made, made our crew so great is that we had so many people that were like that. So many people that were, you know, willing to kind of work together and kind of come together, you know, uh, there, there were departments that, you know, we don't necessarily need to interact with, but, you know, like we had storyboarders that would work with us and, and come over and just ask questions about sets and stuff like that. So there was like a lot of like kind of integration and, and, and it, it was great because everyone was just on board to try to make everything as, as, as good as possible. And, and again, it, it goes out to like, you know, I, I think on some shows, even writers wouldn't necessarily talk to, to you know, the design team or, or, or the, you know, further on, like with the CG team, especially. But, you know, with our shows, everyone was willing to kind of talk to and hang out with everyone and kind of, you know, workshop ideas and, and work through things and i think it really came down to just you know we had people who were willing to you know set their egos aside and, and focus on the project at large thank you that's and that's i think that's just great advice for anyone that's looking to work in the animation industry is just be a good person because as you can see a lot of these people have worked together for several years and they enjoyed working with each other so i think that's uh, very important uh linda uh what is one advice that you would like the attendees to know? So I'm, I'm going to say this, this one piece of advice that I got, like shook me to my core. So this is, I mean, I don't know if it's going to affect you guys that way. Just don't have high expectations, but um, I was told I had, you know, for years I wanted to get into animation and I just never applied because I was like, I'm not good enough. I'm not there yet. I don't know, like, how would I even, you know, go about doing this? So you know, I did apply to some things here and there, like the trainee program at Disney. Spoiler alert, I got rejected. So, you know, it really kind of uh, stopped me from applying to a lot of jobs during that time. And someone told me once, it's not up to you to decide whether or not you're ready. So just apply. Because someone may see something in you that you don't see yet. So don't stop yourself from just taking that shot. And that really, that really affected me at that time. Yeah, I think that's that's amazing advice, and I hope people like also take that to heart because, um, you know, you can grow and learn in any role that you're in it at a production, and a lot of, uh, you know, people that worked at the show grew a lot from working on it. I mean, Kundo, you were, you mentioned earlier that, that this, you know, this felt like a renaissance and a new challenge for you, you know, even after working for several years at the studio. So, I think uh, thank you, Linda. I think that was amazing advice. Uh, Kundo, do you want to go? Uh, I'm basically going to reiterate what Jeff was saying. For I teach at Art Center, and what I tell my students is it's really about your attitude and to be humble and to really listen to what people are saying because no one's job is more important than it. Like I look at it as no one's job is more important than anybody else's job. It's all part of a, a team that we are all trying to come towards one goal. Even a person changing a light bulb or stocking the wall. I mean, there's so many assets to this that you have to respect 
and everybody is part of it. And it just, with this crew, it really felt like that way, even uh, going to India to meet the, some of the vendors, you know, you, you put a human face to it. So you, you respect everybody who's putting all of their hard work into this and it showed. And one of the most important things is what Jeff was saying is to listen and just be a really cool person because there's a lot of incredibly talented people out there, but a lot of people are pretty, there's a good amount of people that are pretty arrogant and you could be the most talented person in the world, but if you have a really bad attitude, you're not going to go very far. Maybe you will, but tr <laughs> trust me, I've been in this industry long enough to know that they burn hot and then they just fade quick. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, Kundo. And Francisco, do you want to give your advice as well? Yeah, well, um, you know, myself coming from Mexico, you know, I, I never thought I, I will end up what I'm doing now um, because you know back in my days I want I knew I wanted to work in movies and and to do cartoons and all that but in Mexico we didn't really had an industry for these and there was no school for these so actually uh, you know I, I, my parents they sent me to because I didn't want to they pretty much sent me to to work in I mean to study business management I, I don't regret it but I, I knew from the beginning that I never never really wanted to do that so when I finished you know university and in business and management I I mean I didn't have opportunities or like doors to knock so so my way of thinking it like if I don't have the opportunities I'm going to create my opportunity so the closest thing to I had to do a movie or to work in a movie was to do comic books you know for me what like like is doing the storyboards would you include everything there and and I started doing my own comic books and I was printing them myself and I had to learn all the printing process and all that stuff and you know after a few years I was getting hired by Marvel and DC to draw stuff for them you know and and I think that was kind of like the foot in the door to get into the party uh, because you know I tried to work hard and then from the comic book uh, like some animation studios saw what I was doing in the books and they started hiring me to design for them you know, so I started designing for animation and video games. And then, you know, uh, I got the opportunity to direct the short film. It was called A Gentleman Duel. And, and then, you know, one thing led me to another. But, uh, but pretty much my advice is that if nobody's opening the door, don't wait for someone to come and tell, you know, and offer you the chance. You, you need to create your chance. And now it's easier than ever because now you have YouTube or Vimeo or like so many places where you can showcase what you do and, you know, and, and create that opportunity or, or be exposed for other people to see what you do and, you know, and get involved into other things. So um, I, that, that will be my bigger advice. That don't, don't wait for that opportunity to come just go outside and chase that opportunity. That's great. That's great advice from all of you. And I, and I think it just goes to show that, you know, all of you guys are great people and you all kind of created your own opportunities and, and it shows in this journey of Tales of Arcadia. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to Lexi to wrap up this talk. So Lexi. Yeah, so as we can see how dark it is in all of your rooms, the very last question is anything you want to say before we end? Anyone can just jump in. I miss working with all you guys this last year and a half. <laughs> I miss you in person. Hopefully not for too long, Kundo. I have I this hope in my heart that I will work with you again, Kundo. And I know it'll come true. I know it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I always miss all the interaction with you guys, you know, because, I mean, I, I know it, uh, we, we, before, uh, and it sounds kind of 
GC, but it, you know, you become family yep. because you know we see each other every day. You know, we we get to know, uh, you know, what we like, what we don't, how this guy explodes, or <laughs> you know, it's it's like 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 a true family. You know that that you interact every day. I mean, sometimes even more than than our true families. You know, I spent more time with you than my wife. <laughs> I mean, I do remember, like, Kundo, like, you working so many late nights, you know, building a lot of these sets. Same for Jeff. You know, you guys would be there a lot for a long time. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't, I believe it that you guys <laughs> spend more time building this world than with your families. What made it all work, too, what was just, uh the amount of nonsense that we allowed ourselves to partake in you know like we just even when things got serious you know kundo would just start cawing like a like a hawk and and you can't take you can't take that seriously so or no matter like, how stressed you are it just like falls off you know or like uh alfonso with his guitar like oh yeah that, that was overtime bliss when he would come over and he thought you were the only one there and he'd come over with a guitar you take your headphones off and you would just start playing guitar right next to you. No one would say anything. You would just start playing. <laughs> like for, for me, especially, this was my first job in animation and I stayed in it for six, seven years. And I feel like it's so linked to my growth as an artist that it's, it's, not, it's gonna leave a permanent mark on my career and I'm happy for it. Like, I feel like you guys are all mentors and I'm gonna stop because I'm gonna cry. <laughs> we we all learn from each other. Yep. No matter how many years you've been in this thing, you always learn something new from the newest guy. <laughs> You're still the best model builder I've ever known, Francisco. Yeah. You you have the highest. Standards, he built a right? car. So. <laughs> <laughs> I got tired of the plastic model builder and <laughs> went to the real deal. Are you building airplane an airplane in your backyard now? <laughs> that'll be kind of cool <laughs> well, well i was gonna say you know on that note you know uh again uh, i want to say thank you for uh taking the time to partake on this knowledge give, give us a little bit behind the scenes of these stories of how you guys work together to build this world and you know as well as the other crew that uh learned on this panel that helped you guys as well so Again, congratulations on such a great journey of Tales of Arcadia and the crown jewel of this feature film. Um, and I want to thank everybody for also attending this talk as well. And hopefully you, you guys took a little bit away and learned a little bit too from this. Um, and again, thank you to Animations uh, for co-hosting this with us. So thank you, Lexi. Thank you to your team. Um, and on that note, uh, I want to wish everybody a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.